Thank you very much for staying um, and or uh, coming in and joining me in this presentation. I'm, I guess in some ways I'm a little bit disappointed that we don't have a bigger crowd, but having a look at the program, um, there is so much going on today. There's a lot of competition. What I can assure you of, though, is that you have made the right choice. Um, you will have the most interesting presentation that's probably ever, that you'll ever probably see in a medical conference. Um, and if you want to dispute that after the presentation, let's do so. Um, so I'm going to talk about veterans health, but first I'm going to take you on a journey uh, to discuss and have a bit of a learn, learning about the conflict in Afghanistan. And why am I talking about veterans health? Because there are about 650,000 living Australian veterans uh, which means that nearly all of us are seeing patients who are veterans and we probably don't know that some of our patients are veterans. And this is a problem because the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare in its 2018 report, A Profile of Australia's Veterans, tells us that veterans have different health issues compared to the broader Australian population. And why am I talking about Afghanistan? Australian soldiers have been in Afghanistan since 2001, making the Af Afghan conflict Australia's longest war. So, not including those who are wearing a uniform, who can tell me what me and my colleagues did and are doing in Afghanistan? The fact is that the average Australian knows more about the Gallipoli landings that occurred 104 years ago than they do about what's currently going on in Afghanistan. The US and its allies, including Australia, conducted counterinsurgency operations in Afghanistan for 14 years. So what does that mean? What is an insurgency? What is a counterinsurgency? In 2015, the majority of Australian or coalition forces were withdrawn from Afghanistan. So does that mean that we won? Or did we lose? I don't recall the Australian government telling me that we lost the war in Afghanistan, but then again, I'm a soldier. And to paraphrase Lord Tennyson in his wonderful poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade, there's not to reason why, there's but to do or die. And what effect does this have on veterans? I will do my best to try to answer these questions. However, counterinsurgency is complicated, so to aid your understanding, I intend to use a medical analogy and provide an example for any medical students who might be in the room, in case there is one or two on how not to present a long case. So the presentation is in two parts. In the first part, I'll present the long case on a very sick patient, and the patient is Afghanistan. In the second part of the presentation, I'll talk about veterans' health and provide practical advice on how to manage veteran patients. So William Osler told us that if you listen to the patient, they will tell you the diagnosis. Afghanistan is a 4,000-year-old country in Central Asia that presents with extreme violence and resistance to imposed democracy on a long-standing background of invasion by foreign powers to which it exhibits an immediate or type 1 hypersensitivity reaction manifested by extreme violence against the invading pathogen until it is effectively defeated. As a consequence of its history, Afghanistan became known as the graveyard of empires. For the purpose of today's long case, I will limit my brief review of the patient's history to the last 100 years, as this is most relevant to the current presentation. The British were defeated in Afghanistan for the third time in 1919, 100 years ago, after which King Amanullah Khan, pictured at top, turned his efforts toward modernising Afghanistan with initiatives including abolition of the veil for women, establishing co-educational schools, and establishing relations with European countries. He also built himself a nice palace. However, the reforms were not popular among tribal and religious leaders, and he was overthrown in 1929. His cousin, 
defeated the rebellion but was assassinated in 1933 and his cousin's son then became king, Muhammad Zahir Shah, shown at the bottom. Zahir Shah continued the reforms initiated by Amin Khan, introducing a bicameral parliament and modernising Afghanistan with the assistance of international advisers. As a result of these modernisation efforts, Afghanistan became known as the Paris of Central Asia. During this period, Kabul, the capital, was a vibrant city achieving what outsiders considered to be a good balance between tradition and modernisation. To the outside observer, Afghanistan presented as a picture of secular modernity, with a central government, a manufacturing sector, universities and schools, and social institutions such as the Girl Scouts. However, throughout this time, there was underlying resentment from tribal and religious leaders who did not agree with some of the modernisation initiatives. And more importantly, the Afghan people were dissatisfied with the monarchy who they viewed as being corrupt. In 1973, Muhammad Dawood Khan, the king's cousin, overthrew the monarchy, declaring himself the first president of Afghanistan. Khan was assassinated in 1978, bringing the pro-Soviet People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, PDPA, into power. The PDPA applied a Soviet-style program of modernising reforms, many of which were viewed as anti-Islam and not supported by the population. This led to a rebellion or an insurgency against government forces led by traditional tribal leaders. The PDPA president was killed in late 1979 and this precipitated the Soviet invasion to prevent the downfall of the communist-backed PDPA government. The rebellion by tribal leaders then became an insurgency with Mujahideen, holy warriors, fighting Soviet and government forces. With a genetic predisposition to resisting invaders, the Mujahideen proved to be very good fighters inflicting significant losses on a technologically superior Soviet army. The Mujahideen also had friends in high places. They were sponsored by the US Central Intelligence Agency through their man on the ground, Charlie Wilson, who provided, among other things, surface-to-air missiles. Afghanistan became a quagmire for the Soviet Union and was known as the Soviet version of the, Af of the Vietnam War. After 10 years, the Soviets withdrew, and noting that this was the second time in recent history that a superpower had been defeated by insurgent or guerrilla forces, there was considerable interest in both sides of the conflict, with the book The Bear Went Over the Mountain providing the Soviet perspective, and the other side of the mountain providing the Mujahideen perspective. The withdrawal of the Soviets led to the collapse of the Afghan government, with the various warlords that fought together to oust the Soviets now fighting between themselves to gain control of Afghanistan. As the civil war destroyed Afghanistan, Mullah Omar, a former Mujahideen fighter who was studying in an Islamic school in Pakistan, didn't like what he saw. So he gathered some of his students, or Talibs, and so was born the Taliban. The Taliban seized control of Kabul in 1996 and eventually nearly all of Afghanistan. The Taliban introduced and ruthlessly enforced a strict version of Islamic law that oppressed women, outlawed music, kite flying and non-Islamic religious effigies. The Taliban also provided sanctuary for Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda within Afghanistan. And then the world changed. As a consequence of 9-11, the US led an invasion of Afghanistan under the banner of Operation Enduring Freedom. The US forces killed many Taliban, but many, including Osama bin Laden, escaped into Pakistan. And ever since then, coalition forces have been fighting an insurgency in Afghanistan. So what is an insurgency? An insurgency is a protracted conflict using subversion and violence to overthrow the government or ruling power to gain control. 
So time for a quick quiz. See if you can name these famous insurgents. Che Guevara. General Vo Nguyen Giap, who served as Ho Chi Minh's strategic advisor against the French in Indochina in the 50s and then against the Americans in Vietnam in the 60s and 70s. Shanana Guzmao, leader of the Revolutionary Front for an Independent East Timor, Fretland, and the first president of East Timor. Mao Zedong, who defeated the Chinese nationalists to seize power in 1949. And Kevin Rudd and Tony Abbott, both of whom undermined a sitting prime minister from their own party, although they don't technically meet the definition of an insurgent because they use subversion without violence. So what is counterinsurgency? It's important to note that counterinsurgency is not a military activity. This is because counterinsurgency is not about treating symptoms. You need to treat the cause. Violence and insecurity are symptoms of an insurgency, but they are not its cause. The insurgency in Afghanistan came about due to the people's dissatisfaction with their government. Thus, the role of the military in counterinsurgency is to address the symptoms while other agencies treat the cause. Quiz number two. Name these counterinsurgents. Lawrence of Arabia, who was a leader of the Arab uprising against the Ottoman Empire. Lawrence in his scrubs. General Stanley McChrystal, who commanded coalition forces in Afghanistan and unfortunately made some unflattering remarks about the US Vice President Joe Biden, which were published in Rolling Stone magazine, uh, ending his military career. In a similar vein, General David Petraeus, who commanded coalition forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, subsequently became the director of the CIA and had resigned after having a uh, extramarital affair with his biographer, whom he met in Iraq. And of course, we've got two other counterinsurgents, both of whom had to deal with an insurgency within their respective caucus. So you recall that an insurgency is a protracted conflict using subversion and violence to overthrow a government and gain power. And to understand the pathogenesis of the insurgency in Afghanistan, you need to look at the sources of power and influence within Afghanistan. You'll recall from the very brief history that I provided that there were two forces exerting power or control within Afghanistan. Formal authority was exercised by the king through the central government and the district governors, whereas informal or traditional power was influenced by the religious leaders, tribal leaders and village elders. And as you go deeper into the Afghan society, down that slide, there is a decline in the influence of the central government and a corresponding increase in the influence of the religious and tribal leaders. And you recall also that it was the tensions between the modernist monarch and his government and the tribal and religious leaders that created a divide between the formal and informal authority within Afghanistan and ultimately led to the overthrow of the monarchy. This divide further widened when the Soviets invaded, with the people fighting against an unpopular government propped up by a foreign invader. The Afghan tribal leaders became the leaders of the Mujahideen, and on the right there, looking like he's wearing a Hessian sack, Hamid Karzai, who became the president of Afghanistan in 2001 through to 2014. As noted previously, after the Soviets withdrew, the warlords fought each other with the Afghan people stuck in the middle of a civil war. Until the Taliban came along, 
They were initially welcomed because they brought law and order back to Afghanistan. However, the people soon realised that life under the Taliban was very different to the old days when Kabul was the Paris of Central Asia. The other warlords didn't go away. They controlled northeastern Afghanistan and also fought the Taliban. After the invasion of Afghanistan, the US installed Hamid Karzai as the president and former government officials were reinstated to provide the central governance function. But the Afghan people weren't happy with this because these were the same corrupt and inefficient bureaucrats that were in place before the Civil War. Consequently, this perpetuated the power divide between the formal and the informal or traditional leaders. The first years of Operation Enduring Freedom were very kinetic. That is, it was all about killing Taliban and a lot of the Taliban were killed. As noted previously, many of these Taliban fled across the border into Pakistan to lick their wounds and to regroup, a state of disease remission for want of a better term. Many Taliban also hid among the people. So which of these guys here are members of the Taliban? All of them. Or maybe none of them. That's one of the great challenges of counterinsurgency. It's a war among the people. And for the team with the home ground advantage, it's easy to look like a local because you are a local. So how about this guy here? Is he a Taliban? He's got a beard. So he meets the first criteria. He looks a bit suspicious and he often has groups of students, Talibs, following him around. He must be a Taliban commander. And there's an old adage, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And in Afghanistan, in the first years of Operation Enduring Freedom, the same held true. If all you have is heavily armed coalition soldiers looking for a fight, then everyone looks like the Taliban. So the preconditions for insurgency are set. We have a corrupt government trying to exert top-down control over the people of Afghanistan. We've got coalition forces hunting Osama bin Laden. And while they are keeping the Taliban at bay, they are not protecting the people. The traditional religious and tribal leaders are exerting influence from the bottom up, but also not meeting the needs of the people. The net result is that the people are caught in the middle. They are vulnerable and they will side with whoever offers them the best option. So now let's build the insurgency. Picture this. Coalition soldiers come across a young man with a beard working in a field and they suspect that he is Taliban. They detain him, beat him up, search his house, and while they're searching his house, they grab his wife, pull off her veil, and search her too. Male soldiers touching an Islamic woman. How do you think that young man feels? He feels angry, very angry. And he may not have been a supporter of the Taliban at the start of that day, but his house has been turned upside down, he's been beaten up, and his wife has just been manhandled by coalition soldiers. So he decides to join the Taliban. And the farmer has family and friends. And when they hear about what the coalition soldiers did, they also side with the Taliban. And the Taliban help these poor farmers. They give them tools and seeds so they can earn an honest living by growing opium poppies. In fact, they help lots of farmers grow opium poppies because the opium industry provides the money for the Taliban to purchase weapons and ammunition. However, the coalition soldiers have other ideas. They destroy the opium fields in Afghanistan that are the source of 
of the world's non-pharmaceutical opium. And in doing so, they deprive the poor Afghan farmers of their livelihood and in turn drive more of the local populace to the side of the Taliban. The Taliban also use coercive methods to gain control of the Afghan people. There are not enough coalition forces to protect every town and village in Afghanistan. If you were faced with intimidation, violence and murder, would you side with the Taliban to protect yourself and your family or hope that the coalition will save you? Do you really have a choice? It's very difficult for the coalition soldiers to understand the true nature of the problem. The Taliban attacked the coalition soldiers and used the local people as human shields. When the coalition soldiers shoot back, it's inevitable that there will be collateral damage, including civilian casualties. Ironically, the Taliban killed four times more civilians than the coalition forces, but they blame the killing on the coalition and most of the time, the Afghan people believe them. And so it continues. Based on the preceding discussion, you can see that an insurgency is not a homogenous entity. There is a small core of violent extremists surrounded by passive and active supporters, many of whom had little choice but to side with the Taliban. By act or omission, the coalition forces find themselves in the middle of an insurgency, partly of their making, and which they don't understand. And now for a medical interlude. The Oxford Handbook of Oncology lists five characteristics of cancer cells. Firstly is the proliferation in the absence of exogenous factors. The insurgency in Afghanistan is not a result of the coalition invasion. This certainly provided an impetus. However, the seeds of the insurgency were sown before coalition forces invaded Afghanistan. Second is the failure to respond to normal breaks on proliferation. The indigenous Afghan national security forces were unable to quell the insurgency because they didn't address its root cause. Third, resistance to apoptosis and senescence. Not only does an insurgency not respond to anti-proliferation mechanisms, it also fights back. Fourth is the ability to recruit blood vessels. An insurgency draws its nourishment from the people either passive or active supporters. And finally, the ability to invade surrounding tissues and metastasize. I hope you could see from my earlier slides that an insurgency spreads like a cancer through a population infecting the people. But it's also important to note that insurgency is not a clonal malignancy. The allegiances of the people change away from the government with some cells more malignant than others. That is, some are passive and some are active supporters. But it's also possible for some of the cells to demutate, that is, to go back to the side of the government. And this has implications for treatment. So if insurgency is a cancer, then counterinsurgency is akin to oncology. And when you deal with a diabolical cancer, like an insurgency, you have to have a cunning plan. And this is it. This is an early draft of General McChrystal's concept for counterinsurgency operations in Afghanistan. Simple. The key takeaway is that counterinsurgency is complicated, and now I will try to explain it. So a quick reminder of the definition of counterinsurgency. It's not about solely military activity. It's comprehensive civilian and military efforts to address the root causes. Again, my Oxford Handbook of Oncology tells me that there are a number of ways to treat a cancer. In treating most cancers, you may employ one or two, perhaps three of these treatment modalities, and you may apply them sequentially or concurrently. In counterinsurgency, you need to do all of these 
and you do them all simultaneously. The first thing you have to do is whole body radiotherapy, the application of military force to rein in the cancer. This is not fractionated. It's applied at supra-therapeutic doses and in a blunt manner because the patient's natural defence systems have been overwhelmed. The aim is to establish security and to buy time. Security provides the conditions in which the patient's immune mechanisms can be restored and time is needed because this is necessarily a long process. Once you've achieved relative security, you can start on the other treatments. Given that the root causes of the insurgency was the Afghan government's inability to meet the needs of its people, this has to be addressed through systemic chemotherapy. The desired outcome is good governance, however the result is usually good enough governance. To achieve this, coalition forces provide security, while organisations such as the United Nations and International Electoral Commission facilitate the conduct of free and fair elections. Now you need to stimulate the patient's immune system. Adapt adjuvant therapies designed to build up the patient's own immune mechanisms are crucial in counterinsurgency. You need to build up both the adaptive immune system, that is military forces, and the innate immune system, the police. If we think about our own society, it's the innate immune system, or the police, that are the most important in the provision of law and order within society. Unfortunately, the standard of police recruits in Afghanistan is very low, and so the quality of the police is generally poor. The flow-on effect is that they are no match for the Taliban, who are killing approximately 300 Afghan policemen per month. If things are going to plan, now is the time for hormone therapy. You have coalition forces providing a blanket of security under which you are fostering governance and indigenous security capabilities. Building up internal security is crucial because as security improves, it allows people to participate in society, agriculture and markets, education, trade training, employment, and infrastructure development. This is important because it means that the people now have a choice. They can side with the Taliban, but if they do so, they risk being targeted by the internal security forces who are much better than the coalition at picking the insurgent out in a crowd. Alternatively, they can go to school or get a job so that they can provide for their family and their future. This part of the treatment is particularly targeted at the passive supporters of the insurgency. As well as hormone therapy, you also want to apply a biologic agent that is specific and has high affinity for the active supporters of the insurgency. In the case of Afghanistan, this is known as disarmament, demobilisation and reintegration. And this leaflet tells the story of Rahim, a former Taliban member who went through the DDR process and at the end got a certificate and a medal. So this is what counterinsurgency looks, at, looks like at the cellular level. If you provide security for the people, if you establish good governance and address the root causes of the insurgency, if you provide education, employment and a better alternative for the passive supporters of the insurgency, if you provide an incentive for the active supporters to give up the fight and return to the government, this is what you're left with. And what do you see? These are the hardcore jihadists, the fundamental Taliban, who will never give up the cause. But now they are not hidden among the people. And what does that mean? Now that you can see them, you can kill them. Debulking surgery to reduce the cancer is a key element of treatment. And now that the cancerous lesions are visible, they can be precisely targeted by special forces. It's important to note that unlike a cancer, in counterinsurgency, the emphasis is on building resistance 
among the people rather than targeting the cancer, although inevitably you have to do that too. Although my reconstruction makes it sound easy, it's not. You'll recall from earlier in the presentation I said that counterinsurgency is not a military activity. The military certainly has a role, but experts suggest that this accounts for only 20% of the total effort. The other 80% is the comprehensive political, economic, psychosocial and civic actions taken to address the root causes of the insurgency. And this is where we failed. From a military perspective, we destroyed the insurgency three times over, and every time it came back because we didn't address the cause. We treated the symptoms, but not the presenting complaint. Lawrence of Arabia said that counterinsurgency is like eating soup with a knife, inevitably messy and always slow. However, the reality is that governments that contribute forces to a coalition want to eat quickly and leave. The problem with this approach is that the faster you try to eat soup with a knife, the more you are going to spill. Western governments need an exit strategy because war, particularly a protracted counterinsurgency, comes at a high price in terms of blood and treasure. And counterinsurgency therapy is not funded by the PBS. Australia has spent about $9 billion so far on the war in Afghanistan, and in 2013 was spending about $3.8 million each day. At the same time, 2013, the US had spent $1.5 trillion, with the war costing them $290 million per day. For this, we have established what President Obama described as an unreliable and ineffective government and built up an indigenous security capability that is being eroded at a rate of about 500 per month. And this doesn't include the police and soldiers who desert at a rate that is approximately four times the number that are killed. These same police and soldiers are the West's exit strategy from Afghanistan. And behind these grim statistics is the human face of Australia's commitment. 40 young Australians killed, nearly 25% of whom were killed by the Afghan soldiers they worked with. A further 262 have been wounded. If I was to present US military deaths in the same fashion, I would need 61 slides. So what was it all for? After Australia withdrew its combat forces, the Taliban regained or reclaimed control of the province that Australian forces were providing security for. The Taliban now controls or holds influence over more Afghan territory than at any point since coalition forces entered Afghanistan in 2001. Yet there are still coalition troops in Afghanistan, including Australia. And for what? After nearly 18 years, the security situation is worse, not better. And when one of Australia's senior generals with first-hand experience of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan tells us it's time to cut and run because there can be no happy ending in Afghanistan, what do you say to the Australian people and the veterans of the Afghanistan conflict? You recall that the subtitle of this presentation is a case study in oncology. The trouble with cancer is that you can utilise all the treatment measures without defeating the cancer. In doing so, the patient endures the effects of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, <clears throat> surgery, 
but does not survive. And then you ask yourself, was it worth it? My Oxford Handbook of Oncology includes one other treatment approach for cancer that I didn't list on my slide. Palliation. I don't know what palliation of Afghanistan looks like, but I suspect with Donald Trump's desire to pull everything back that we're probably going to see the palliation of Afghanistan in the next few years. And on that bright note, now I want to turn to the second part of my presentation, Veterans Health. I suspect that few people, if anyone in this room, knows that next week is Veterans Health Week. The theme for this year is mental wellness. Veterans mental health has been the subject of numerous studies and reports in Australia, and it's the topic that attracts significant political attention. Indeed, one month ago today, Darren Chester, the Minister for Veterans and Defence Personnel, appealed for help from the community to assist in the development of a national action plan to improve veterans mental health and wellbeing. So in the second part of this presentation, I will talk about mental wellness among veterans and veterans health more broadly. This is important because as I said, at the beginning of the presentation, there are about 650,000 living veterans in Australia. And it's important to understand how veterans health needs differ from those of the broader Australian community. Before I talk about veterans, mental health, I need to define the term veteran. The term veteran has traditionally been used to describe someone who has served in a war. For most Australians, the term veteran is associated with old men in suits with medals marching on Anzac Day. Some may associate the term veteran with the current generation of soldiers who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan or on peacekeeping missions closer to home, such as in East Timor and the Solomon Islands. However, in 2017, the Minister for Veterans Affairs expanded the definition of veteran. A veteran is now defined as any person who is serving or has served in the ADF. This new definition means that the majority of Australian veterans are young men and women, many of whom have not served overseas. When you think about veterans' mental health, there are two issues that attract the most attention. Suicide and PTSD. Indeed, based on media reporting, it would seem that everyone who served in Iraq and Afghanistan has PTSD. However, the findings of recent studies into veterans' health tell us that this is not the case but also tell us that we do need to be concerned about the mental well-being of veterans. The Transition and Wellbeing Research Program commenced in 2015 and is the most comprehensive study undertaken in Australia that examines the impact of military service on the mental, physical and social health of serving and ex-serving ADF personnel. The research program consists of three studies comprising eight reports and two papers. The research program has 10 objectives, including to determine the prevalence of mental health disorders among ex-ADF personnel, to assess pathways and barriers to care for serving and ex-serving personnel, to examine the physical health of serving and ex-serving personnel, to look at how the mental well-being of serving and ex-serving personnel changes over time, and to examine the health and well-being of ADF personnel who deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq. And I'll very briefly talk about the findings of each of these so you can better understand the health needs of your veteran patients. Before discussing the findings, it's also important, though, to provide context. When it comes to mental health, there are two risk factors that are peculiar to veterans. Firstly, military service presents unique occupational stressors, and studies have shown that veterans experience a significantly higher prevalence of lifetime 
trauma compared with a socio-demographically matched Australian community. With increased exposure to trauma, it can be expected there will be an increase in the prevalence of mental health disorders among veterans. And the second risk is transition. That is, when a soldier, sailor or airman leaves the military and returns to civilian life. 60 to 75% of transition military members report an easy adjustment to civilian life. However, for some veterans, this is the most stressful event in their life due to changes in identity, community, residence, social networks, status, family roles, occupation, finance, routines, responsibilities, supports and culture. Changes brought about, the transition, brought about by the transition process can precipitate the onset of mental illness or exacerbate existing mental illness. And this is particularly the case for soldiers who are discharged involuntarily. So prevalence. The mental health prevalence study undertaken in 2015 looked at the difference in mental wellness between two subgroups of veterans. Those who had transitioned from the regular ADF between 2010 and 2014, and those who were still serving in the regular ADF in 2015. As you can see from the slide, about 24,000 transition veterans and 20,000 regular ADF members were invited to participate. Of those, only 18% of transition members chose to do so, whereas 42% of the regular ADF personnel responded to the survey. Given the, no, the low number of respondents among the transition veterans, there may be some self-selection bias and some of the findings may need to be interpreted in this light. The findings of the Mental Health Prevalence Study clearly show that mental health among veterans is poorest amongst those who have left the regular ADF and specifically among those who have discharged completely. That is, that they're not continuing to serve in the reserve. And I think three factors explain these findings. Firstly, regular ADF personnel undergo annual mental health screening. And if a screening threshold is reached, then intervention is initiated. Second, most, AD, most regular ADF personnel have ready access to support services, including the ability to self-refer to on-base psychologists without having to see a GP. On the other hand, 50% of veterans or transition veterans are not registered with the Department of Veterans Affairs, through whom they have free access to mental health services. Finally, transition itself. As already noted, the transition process can precipitate the onset of mental illness or exacerbate existing mental illness. The other key findings of the prevalence study are that length of service, length of time since transition is also associated with mental health problems, with rates generally lowest in the first 12 months after separation and then highest in the next few years, which highlights the critical importance of the early transition years to the long-term mental health of veterans. Reason for discharge is also a key factor in veterans' mental health. Veterans who are discharged involuntarily, that is, kicked out of the Defence Force, have sig significantly higher rates of mental health disorder. This is particularly the case for veterans who are discharged on medical grounds. Rank is also a discriminator, with significantly higher rates of mental health disorders among soldiers rather than officers. There is also a positive correlation between multiple deployments and mental health problems. And finally, there is an inverse relationship between length of ADF service and mental health disorders, with those serving less than eight years being more vulnerable. Statistics on veterans' suicide also show a significant difference between serving ADF personnel, both regular and reserve, and fully transitioned personnel. Again, these statistics show that involuntary discharge is a significant risk factor. It's interesting to note that although deployment is positively associated with mental health illness, there is no clear association with suicide. The Pathways to Care report shows 
that veterans report very high rates of engagement with their GP. This is because they are conditioned to do so while serving in the ADF through mandatory routine health assessments, annual mental health screening, pre and post deployment health screening, and the requirement to present to a GP if they want to be excused from their military duties, even if they only have minor ailments. However, this report identified two areas of concern. Firstly, about 30% of veterans waited for more than 12, 12 months to seek help for mental health concerns. Delay in seeking help is associated with worsening symptoms and poorer prognosis. The fact that costs were seen as a barrier to seeking help is also of concern because veterans are entitled to free treatment for mental health problems through DVA. The second major concern is that only 25% of veterans who sought help report receiving CBT. And this is of concern because CBT is the recommended treatment for the most prevalent mental health conditions among veterans. The physical health report shows that veterans have different health problems to the broader community, and specifically the younger veterans. The three most commonly reported doctor-diagnosed conditions among veterans are chronic low back pain, other musculoskeletal conditions, and hearing loss. And these pictures explain why. On the right is a soldier carrying a load of approximately 57 kilograms on patrol in Afghanistan. And on the left, noise exposure is a common hazard in the military workplace. The impact of combat study looks at the mental well-being of veterans who deployed to the Middle East area of operations between 2010, mid-2010 and mid-2012, and then subsequently participated in the 2015 Transition and Wellbeing Research Program. The three time points for mental health screening, pre-deployment, post-deployment, and then about three years later, allowed researchers to assess the changes in mental well-being over time. As some of the participants had discharged from the regular ADF since returning from deployment, the study also allowed for a comparison between transitioned and serving veterans. These graphs show rates of depressive symptoms, psychological distress and PTSD across the three time points. It's important to note that the majority of participants remain healthy and largely asymptomatic, although rates of psychological symptoms and disorders have increased over time and more so in the transition personnel compared to those who remained in the regular ADF. Despite these findings, most participants remain below screening thresholds. This study is important because it highlights the significance of subsyndromal symptoms as an indicator of risk for future progression to a diagnosable disorder. These findings also highlight the importance of early identification of symptoms of depression, psychological distress, and PTSD. So, putting the findings of the research program together, what are the implications for us, and particularly those outside this room, who are primary care providers in the community? First and foremost, there is a need to understand the veteran patient and specifically to identify the red flags that indicate your veteran patient may be at higher risk for mental health problems. The best way to do this is to obtain a brief service history from your veteran patient. How long did they serve in the ADF? What role did they perform? Were they a soldier or an officer? Did they deploy overseas? If so, where did they go? When did they go? What was it like when they deployed? Was it a positive or a negative experience? Did they sustain any physical injuries or any mental health issues during their ADF service? If so, have these conditions been accepted by DVA? When did they leave the ADF? Why did they leave the ADF? Was it voluntary or involuntary? Do they have a copy of their transfer of healthcare clinical summary? We like our forms in the ADF, the PM522, transfer of clinical care. 
Do they have copies of all their medical records? Are they registered with DVA? If not, why not? Most of you will be aware that veterans are entitled to a veteran's health check under the MBS. However, some of you may not be aware that the entitlement for this has changed recently. Personnel who leave the ADF on or after the 1st of July this year are entitled to an annual health check for five years after discharge. This new entitlement arises from one of the key findings of the research program, that veterans are at an increased risk of adverse physical and mental health outcomes during the first five years after discharge from the regular ADF. Finally, when you do an annual veteran health check, it's important that it's done properly. The standard practice templates for our MBS health assessment don't, as a norm, incorporate screening for PTSD and anxiety and depression. Yet the findings of the Transition and Wellbeing Research Program highlight the importance of doing this for every veteran, every year, for the first five years after discharge. Consequently, DVA has developed a comprehensive guide and prepared supporting resources to assist GPs in the conduct of veterans health assessment. The supporting resources include templates for both best practice and medical director, links to screening tools, advice on referral and treatment options, links to patient and practitioner information, and advice on pathways into treatment for non-liability healthcare and DVA accepted conditions. To conclude, at the beginning of this presentation, I set out to achieve one goal, which was to help you better understand your veteran patients. I hope that I have at least partly achieved this and I welcome any questions.